Hello, and welcome to the Disrupting PFAS podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Hale. For this season of the podcast, I have curated four episodes focusing on the detection, destruction, and sequestration of PFAS using novel materials or processes. Today, I will be talking with Dr. Sarah Wu of the University of Idaho about PFAS destruction by plasma treatment. I chose this topic based on Dr. Wu's award-winning concept of, of using a continuous flow liquid phase plasma discharge process to remove PFAS from AFFF. It was one of the winning topics submitted to the US EPA Innovative Ways to Destroy PFAS Challenge. Let's learn more about the technology from one of its innovators. Welcome to the podcast, Sarah. Thank you, Jeff, for having me here in your, in your podcast. Well, it's great to have you and we appreciate you joining. Uh, so before we get into the technology and research itself, um, I've enjoyed reading about your academic and research background. Um, could you tell us about your graduate work and your postdoc work at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities? Sure. Well, um, my graduate and postdoc work at the University of Minnesota was mostly about the agricultural wastewater treatment and renewable energy and re re nutrient recovery from the wastewaters through biological and chemical treatment processes like fermentation, anaerobic digestion, electrolysis, and microbial fuel cells. So the goal of my research was to minimize the effect of the waste and wastewaters to the environment and also maximize the resource recovery from the wastewaters and biomass. Yeah. Well, very, very exciting. It sounds like you're on the leading edge of some uh, exciting topics. And I especially like the emphasis on, you know, not only the environmental protection uh, aspect, but um, whatever you want to call it, upcycling or recycling or, you know, getting yeah. you know, beneficial uh, aspects out of that process. So uh, that's very exciting. So how did you come to work at the University of Idaho? Well, um, so I was hired at the Department of Biological Engineering at the University of Idaho in 2016. So this tenure track faculty position fits my career goal mostly for being a researcher and educator in academia in the direction of biological and environmental engineering. So I think I was also well prepared with the experience and the expertise to contribute to the departmental needs in this place. So I'm always thankful for the perfect timing and opportunity that brought me to the University of Idaho. Uh, excellent. Um, I think, you know, preparation and timing are, are very important uh, when it comes to, you know, pursuing your goals. Um, so I noticed you have a background in environmental and biological engineering. I think you've mentioned that uh, thus far already. Uh, could you talk about how you combine physical, chemical, and biological processes for environmental remediation? Well, um, under the overall goal of the environmental remediation and also energy recovery, we as engineers usually think from the problems in waste management and the environmental effect as a big picture. And we have to compare different solutions and try to select the best in value, which a lot of times take more than uh, one process or principle to work out. For example, um, one research project I did was to deal with the liquid swine manure as a waste stream and a renewable energy source. So we proposed to first uh, produce two biogases, both um, biohydrogen and methane, as the major energy products out of the waste by developing a two-step biological process, which, which uh, separated fermentation from the traditional anaerobic digestion. And in order to further recover high levels of the hydrogen uh, and uh, the nit nitrogen and phosphorus in the manure, we chose to use a chemical precipitation process to produce a stufide as a fertilizer product, but with the need of amending magnesium element. So the novelty of our solution to that, um, to that stufide production step was to build uh, on an electrolysis process with magnesium electrode as the source of magnesium instead of adding chemicals. So finally, in order to use hydrogen gas that produced from fermentation, you will need to separate the byproducts 
uh, the byproduct, which is carbon dioxide, out by membrane or other technologies, which would be more physical and or by chemical uh, scrubbing with a basic solution, something like that. So better off, um, that's how, you know, the example of how we combine different technologies, physical, chemical, and biological. And the better off, one of the problems we encountered in this project also led me to the plasma technology as a solution for killing unwanted and undesired bacteria in the fermentation process. So yeah, this is how you see a lot of times we solve one environmental problem, we have to relate and combine all kinds of processes and technologies to achieve a good solution or even just to make it work. Well, it's very exciting. Um, you know, one thing we're trying to do here in the podcast is really uh, drill into and focus on the elements of the technology. But I really like your your big picture thinking, uh, how you're putting, you know, multiple processes and disciplines together uh, to tackle these problems and then translating what you've learned into solving other problems. And, you know, as we've already talked about in this conversation, um, you know, addressing environmental issues, uh, but then also the, you know, gaining the benefit of, you know, a renewal energy aspect, uh, just very exciting. So um, very glad you're on the podcast and also very glad you're uh, turning your talents towards uh, PFAS solutions. Thank you. So um, congratulations on completing your fifth year at the Univers University of Idaho. Um, could you, you've talked a lot about some exciting research already. Uh, could you please just give us an overview of some of the other uh, research being conducted at the University of Idaho? Sure. Um, so I came to University of Idaho with the, at that time, newly invented liquid plasma, uh, liquid phase plasma discharge technology for biodiesel production. While the development of one technology can take years, I decided to focus uh, my research program here majorly on designing and developing liquid plasma technology or process as a core and a green technique for various environmental and renewable energy applications. As I see that a lot of challenges and unlimited opportunities in this area, that the principle of liquid phase plasma discharge can play an important role and provide working solutions. So the research work that I'm leading right now um, include production of biofuels, um, the production of green chemicals like nitrogen fertilizer, disinfectant and pesticide, as well as milk processing and water disinfection, which are more for <laughs> microbial inactivation. In addition to the water and wastewater treatment, especially for tackling emerging contaminants like PFAS and heavy metals. So that's, there's a lot of work in my lab going on and very excited. Yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, sounds like you and the University of Idaho are definitely uh, a leader in this area. Um, so before we get into the details of the plasma technology and before we start uh, talking about PFAS in particular, um, I wanted to ask you more of a philosophical question. So as I've mentioned, I really appreciate your, you know, your, your strategic and big picture view about how to tackle these types of problems. Um, so PFAS are regarded as one of the most challenging environmental contaminants we deal with. Um, what is your outlook as a technologist for our ability to tackle this human-made contaminant with technology? Well, to get to know our ability to tackle the problem, we need to know the problem itself and the cause of the problem. So from the technology point of view, the treatment of PFAS is particularly challenging because all the PFAS chemicals have this strongest uh, carbon fluorine chemical bond that is mm -hmm. almost nothing can break, which makes their degradation or destruction extremely difficult. Um, so completely destru complete destruction of PFAS means that you have to find a way to cleavage all the CF bond you know, carbon fluorine bonds and all the, also this, this carbon carbon bonds of the chemicals. So each technology has its limit. 
I'm generally optimistic about the solutions on PFAS problems because all kinds of technologies are being developed and improved. Finally, the challenges will be tackled with technology working together. Yeah, I think that's a great summary. Um, I think I share your outlook there. I mean, we definitely have to appreciate uh, the challenges of this uh, tough emerging contaminant. Um, but I'm also optimistic, especially talking to yourself and other innovators on the podcast, that um, we will tackle it. Technology will play an important role, um, but um, I, I also see it uh, you know, combining technologies um, to tackle PFAS. Okay, Sarah, let's get into the technology itself. Uh, first of all, congratulations on receiving an award for the EPA's Innovative Ways to Destroy PFAS Challenge. Could you please tell us about that contest? Sure. Um, so to my knowledge, this contest or challenge was made by the uh, US EPA, partnering, partnering with the US Department of Defense and other environmental departments. And the goal was to solicitate new non-thermal technologies and approaches to treat PFAS. And they also particularly require that the provided solution to remove at least 99% of the PFAS in the unused AFFF, um, which is the um, aqueous film forming foam while preventing the creation of harmful byproducts, which sounded a near impossible mission. Well, based on uh, our discussion so far, I'm not surprised that uh, you wanted to take on that challenge. Um, so what motivated you to uh, enter the contest? Well, I would say my motivation to submit a solution to this challenge is based on the confidence on my technology which had created some prom promising results and showed excited, um, exciting potential for becoming an ideal solution. I love that response. That's great. I appreciate your, uh, your confidence in the technology. Um, so let's get into the technology. Uh, your topic is titled Continuous Flow Liquid Phase Plasma Discharge Process to Remove PFAS from AFFF. And as you mentioned, AFFF is aqueous film forming foam that contains PFAS and that material has tr uh, traditionally been used to um, suppress uh, liquid hydrocarbon fire fires. Uh, let's discuss the elements of the research topic to better understand the technology. So first off, what is plasma? Well, um, plasma can be simply defined just at the fourth state of matters that usually goes from a gas phase with intensive energy input. So the material will be ionized and enter a plasma state. So the material or molecules is not in a molecular form, but full of the electrons, charged particles, reactive species, and thus it becomes extremely reactive. And plasma in nature is very common. Um, so if you notice the fire, sun, even northern light, like lighting, lightning, and over 99% of the matters in the universe is actually plasma. And there are also applications of plasma discharge around us, like the plasma TV and the vacuum lighting. Well, that's a great explanation. I appreciate the examples. I think a lot of people are, you know, learned the three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas, um, but never really thought of plasma being that fourth um, phase of matter. And I think that's a great explanation. And you gave some good examples. It certainly helped me understand it better. So how does plasma destroy or degrade PFAS? Well, basically in the field of water wastewater treatment, plasmas induced by high voltage electric discharge serve as advanced oxidation and reduction processing that generate richer sources of reactive species when discharging water or in contact with water. Those species are produced by electrons, attack water molecules, such as aqueous electrons, um, hydroxyl radicals, singlet oxygen radicals, superoxide radicals, and also can produce ozone, hydrogen peroxide, and UV radiation, 
without adding any chemicals. So these reactive species can attack the carbon fluorine bond and the carbon carbon bond to destroy or degrade PFAS. Also, it's proposed that the shock waves, high electrical fields, or intensive heat and localized high pressure and acoustic waves even produced with the plasma discharge can also contribute to the destruction of PFAS. So plasma processing is deemed as a combined physical and chemical process that produce a much stronger effect than the conditional, a country, conventional chemical oxidation and reduction process to break multiple recalcitrant carbon and fluorine bonds. Well, that's a great explanation. It's been very informative for me. It uh, seems to stick with your theme of using you know, multiple processes like physical and chemical um, and attacking PFAS on a variety of fronts uh, through the plasma process. So um, again, very informative and thanks for that great explanation. Um, I guess moving beyond plasma, could you please describe the continuous flow and liquid phase aspect? Yes. So let me start a little bit on the traditional atmospheric pressure, um, non-thermal plasma technology. Um, they are mostly based on electrical discharge in the gas phase, such as barrier discharge, which you might heard of, and a gliding arc discharge. They have shown fast removal of PFAS, but with relatively lower defluorine rate, defluorination rate, which means you completely cut the carbon and fluorine bond. So the reason most likely be the limitation in the mass transfer of short-lived reactive species from the gas phase to aqueous phase. Another big challenge for gas phase plasma to face if we are in the treatment of AFFF, which is with the uh, highest concentration of PFAS, would be the intensive foaming. Right, you, 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 we could imagine that the foaming would also significantly affect the discharge stability as the gas discharge is contact with the foaming agents. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, we would say that the in liquid electric discharge without needing a gas, although technically requires a higher breakdown voltage to initiate may become a better solution for HFFF concentrate rejuvenation as well as the com more complete destruction and defluorination of PFAS in any aqueous solution. So the liquid phase plasma discharge technique has the advantage of operating on the room temperature and pressure insensitive to contaminants and environmental disturbance, thus greatly, you know, fitting the treatment of this uh, PFAS scenario and also simplify the scale up process without leading to invest heavily in the capital cost or equipment. And the continuous flow liquid phase plasma discharge reactor features a totally different configurations of the electrodes, electrodes and location for the liquid phase plasma, plasma discharge um, through a unique reactor design. So this reactor design allows the reactive species to be more focused on the, and concentrated to react with the liquid that pass through in this continuous um, discharge device that we designed and more uniform treatment can be achieved. So that's why we call it a continuous flow liquid phase plasma discharge and uh, at the same time, the reactor reactor size is is reduced and uh, fairly small. So that's a great explanation, Sarah. I really like how you've taken the essence of the plasma uh, technology itself and integrated with uh, some innovations to uh, your patented reactor. So I think it's important to understand that there's the plasma process, but there's also how it's used in uh, the particular reactor. So uh, that's, I think it's very interesting to me and as well as the audience. Uh, so the focus of the EPA challenge was to treat PFAS in firefighting foam. 
um, and that can be a very high concentration matrix. Um, but I notice you are also working on PFAS destruction in drinking water by plasma treatment, and drinking water may have uh, much less concentration of PFAS. We know that uh, some of the drinking water criteria um, are, you know, are very stringent but protective. So, uh, is plasma treatment applicable to a variety of matrices and concentrations of PFAS? Yes. Based on the principle of plasma destroying PFAS, its ability is not supposed to be limited by the concentrations or types of PFAS uh, or types of matrices, except for soil, as long as it's, it's in, the, in the liquid phase. So, uh, but we have noticed that the electrical conductivity of the matrices will be rather concerned for initiating the electric discharge in the liquid. Therefore, you know, plasma treatment is uh, theoretically applicable to a variety of matrices and concentrations, but still has some limitations or hurdles to overcome, uh, just depending on the scenario or the applications. Okay. Um, so what are the results shown so far? Well, uh, so we have by far not a lot of results yet, but the preliminary results with the PFOA is that the model chemical at about 10 milligram per liter, which is uh, like PPM, 10 to the 6 PPT, have indicated that our um, continuous soil liquid phase plasma discharge process was able to reduce the PFOA concentration by about 90% over 30 minutes and 94.3% in 60 minutes, which is better than the highest removal efficiency reported in the literature. Um, and our results also showed a potential to further increase the removal rate with either uh, longer treatment time or improve the operating conditions because we haven't optimized, fully optimized the process yet. And the better off, the high uh, floor rise concentration we observed at the end of the treatment period indicated uh, about 96.4% of the defluorination, uh, which means the fluorine in the PFOA removed um, is. 96 percent uh, be cut off as the fluoride and also there's only uh, about one to two percent of the fluorine in the PFOA removed was resulted in the shorter chain byproducts. So those results are pretty impressive. I mean 10 I think you said milligram per liter concentration so really high, uh, I mean, what we would probably, what we would see in a firefighting foam in, in the concentrate and, you know, approaching 100% uh, degradation um, in, in an hour. Um, so that's pretty impressive. And it, you're looking at fluorine analysis on the back end to confirm that you're not just breaking the molecules in half, that you're actually cleaving the fluorines off. And it, it looks like you're getting uh, really good results, not just transforming, um, the PFAS into shorter molecules, but actually mineralizing them. Is that a good uh, uh, summary? Yes. Yeah, so based on these results, we were um, pretty confident that this process can be engineered to handle HFF concentration um, and for effect effectively and efficiently destroying 99% of PFAS in the HFF concentrate, concentrate formulations. Yeah, exciting results, and I think you also said, you know, you haven't even quite optimized the system yet. Uh, so initial results uh, without, you know, tuning or optimizing are looking pretty good. So uh, sounds like there's uh, uh, more good research to come on that. Um, so you actually, in a prior response, you talked about scalability, um, and that's a question I have. Um, you know, what, how scalable is uh, this technology? Well, um, since we have not scaling it up yet, but based on the principle, because our process is running in a continuous mode, 
It also provides the flexibility to stack multiple modules on top of each other to improve the effectiveness or connect them like multiple units in parallel to handle higher liquid flow rates instead of increasing the reactor size as with the vessel type reactors that can pose difficulties during the scale up. So we still need to work on it, but that's the theory based that uh, we assume that would ha our technology has a pretty good scalability. So Sarah, do you see this as a standalone technology or something that would be integrated with other technologies? Um, I would say it can be used either as a standalone or integrated with other technologies, depending on the application scenario. So treatment, for example, treatment of high concentration PFAS solution will need to integrate with a probably fluoride precipitation process because it produces a high amount of fluoride uh, ions, which will be acidic because it combines with the hydrogen ions. So we need a precipitation of fluoride process to neutralize the pH and the conductivity. While treating the low concentration can be sent alone or pair with the concentration technologies like membrane to make the process more energy efficient. Okay, that's a great answer and good information. I think we're uh, that's the theme we're getting uh, through a lot of these discussions that uh, you know there's a certain power to combining technologies together to really tackle the PFAS problem. Um, but you know the standalone potential of plasma is also pretty impressive. Uh, so you know at this point you've explained plasma to us, how it works uh, to destroy PFAS, and that you've engineered a pretty unique reactor that um, makes use of that process. Um, how would you describe the technology readiness level of the plasma process you're researching? Well, uh, it's a currently basically a lab scale development, and the we are targeting at the improvement of the design of the reactor as well as the um, operational mode and optimization of the process and hopefully with some funding and we will need funding to start working on the scale up and the demonstration of the technology for PFAS destru destruction. Okay so with that Sarah um, you know what further development is planned or in process? How would you take this further? Well, of course, depending on the funding uh, source or the, the the plan or the purpose of the funding, we have to accommodate this technology for different matrices um, and the concentrations, and also to investigate the effect of the co-contaminants on PFAS removal and destruction before scaling up. So there are different levels and perspectives of technology development that we have to plan. And okay. right now, um, our focus is more on the you know lab ma uh, lab scale optimization of the process in terms of improving the oper oper operating conditions uh, to at least achieve the desired PFAS removal rate and efficient and energy efficiency. So Sarah, do you have any publications in progress or can we expect to see you on the conference circuit? We have enough data for a publication and we're in the process of writing the manuscript and we'll submit it to a journal soon. And uh, we are going to disseminate our findings, of course, in some conferences soon too. Um, so we got we, we, we were funded with uh, USA NIFA for a drinking water process, uh, drinking water treatment by by uh, for PFAS removal, and uh, we definitely will participate at the ASAB annual meeting, which is the associate uh, American Associate of uh, no, American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineers annual meeting, uh, for that, for reporting the results of the, that project. And yeah, I also see a lot of environmental engineering society kind of conferences that we could also go to 
you know, communicate our findings. Okay, well, that's great. We'll definitely keep an eye out for any publications that will be coming out, and we hope to see you uh, on the conference circuit. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Disrupting PFAS podcast. Thank you to Dr. Sarah Wu of the University of Idaho for joining us today. I'm your host, Jeff Hale, reminding you to never say forever. 